Checkout Tracking by the NPD Group brings you a receipt collecting system that gathers data anonymously through technology we created, providing your businesses with answers. Thank you very much. Um, so real quick, today what we want to do is, is really kind of get into the nuts and bolts of ad monetization in mobile games. So we're going to try to avoid things like, what is the future of advertising? And really get down to, you know, what are some things you need to know as you try to scale your advertising monetization on mobile? So we've got a great group of panelists here today, and uh, I'm going to put you guys on the spot for just a second for like really quick intro about your company and what you do there. Brian, you want to start? Sure. Uh, Big Blue Bubble. We're a uh, Ontario-based uh, mobile game company. Uh, My Singing Monsters is, is probably by far our, our biggest hit to date. Um, we've been in business for 11 years. Started in mobile with J2 Me and Brew and then kind of grown from there. Uh, my role at the company is uh, I'm Senior Vice President um, and I kind of oversee uh, a whole lot of the, uh, the business, um, including um, uh, monetization and user acquisition amongst uh, other things. My name is Kenneth. Uh, I work for Hot Hat Games. Hot Games is based in uh, Vancouver. Uh, we have around 140 staff right now, and uh, our biggest game so far is Kill Shot. Uh, it's a first-person shooting game, and uh, my role is a uh, senior monetization manager. So I'm in, char uh, in charge of ad ops, uh, in-game economy, uh, in-game sales, sales agent, and all sort of fun thing that brings revenue into the game. Chandra Macias Hill, Mobility Wear. Uh, we're the makers of a number of card-based games and casino games. Uh, Solitaire on iOS and Android are probably our biggest titles. Uh, company is based down in Irvine, been around for approximately 25 years, and uh, I oversee monetization for all the titles. Uh, Michelle Tobin, I work for Rovio Entertainment, which is probably best known for Angry Birds, uh, based in Finland, and I run our global brand partnerships and advertising business. Cool. Thank you, guys. OK, so for this panel, we're going to do something a little bit different from the typical panel. I figured, having done a few of these before, we could be a little bit more efficient and hopefully more interesting if I actually asked these guys some questions in advance and got their answers and threw them up on the screen. So what we've done is we've got several you know, kind of high-level questions about monetization. You'll see four answers up there, anonymous. You won't know who said what which should keep it interesting. And then, you know, so from there, instead of spending too much time just asking the basics, we'll, we'll just dive right into what these numbers, what these answers mean. So when you're making a game, you're often thinking about what's best for my players. How do I retain them? How do I make them happy? How do I grow into this massive success? But often, you're also conflicted, perhaps, with what's best for my business. And one of the things I just want to keep a lens on today is how do you find that sweet spot between, you know, player experience and monetization? And that's, I think, something that all these guys grapple with and, and try to find that right balance. So just keep that in mind as we think about you know, what's, what's best for the players versus what's best for the business and if you can actually make that one instead of a competing situation. So the very first thing I want to talk about is getting right to the heart of the business part. What I ask them is, what is the percentage of your game's revenue that comes from ads? And what we see is, of the four panelists, half of them are saying 20 to 30% of their revenue comes from ads, and actually half of them are saying more than 30% comes from ads. So pretty significant part of the business. Um, I'm going to kind of open this up to whoever wants to talk about it first, but does anyone want to share a story with you know, how they evolved to get to this level? Because we hear a lot of games make, oh, 5%, 10% of their, their revenue. Now, this is pretty serious. Like, this is a, a decent part of your business. Is this something you guys set out to do? Is it something that's evolved? Anything that's really kind of from a practical standpoint, like what advice you would give to kind of escalating revenue from ads? Yeah, I could start with that. So when, when we first launched My Scene Monsters, it was roughly about 2 to 3% of overall revenues was, was uh, generated through, through ads. Um, I think if you look at My Scene Monsters versus a lot of our other games, we're actually pretty conservative on, on how we serve ads. Uh, you know, we want, we're very careful not to uh, interrupt uh, gameplay um, as best as possible. Um, so we target non-paying users uh, as after a certain time within the game. Um, and really for us, it, it, you know, we started out with uh, interstitials and then, you know, we stayed away from banners just because I think it's just too in intrusive um, during the gameplay experience and, and we're, we're, I think we're very uh, careful not to, to, to wreck that for, for the users. Um, and as the game grew, uh, we started looking at videos, uh, both forced video views, rewarded video views, uh, but not really necessarily increasing the, the, um, 
the amount of placements and uh, the amount of, of ads being shown. Um, there's, uh, I think obviously as, as the space gets more competitive, you know, with through mediation, we're able to be able to, uh, to, to kind of uh, really optimize um, the ads being shown and, and really increasing those eCPMs and, and really that's where, you know, where we fall into that, obviously the category over there of 20 to 30 percent. Um, and it's, it's really kind of, you know, both, you know, brands coming in, um, some of the, the, the um, advertisers within the gaming space are spending an incredible amount of money to, to gain new users. Uh, and, and when you see, I think, the uptick in both, it's, it's kind of a natural progression as far as uh, how much revenue that you're going to see out of these ads. So, um, sorry. <laughs> um, so I guess the percentage is kind of arbitrary, right? Because it all depends on what genre of the game you have and how much money you're actually generating um, through microtransaction. Because you, if you look at some, a game like Crossy Row, right? Crossy Row actually does a lot of more revenue coming from ads than actual microtransaction. Um, but for a game like um, you know Heyday, um, it would be a small percentage because their microtransaction is so well and have been done so well. For us anyway, um, we as first and foremost, I agree with Brian, is it has to establish the user experience. And uh, for Killshot anyway, at the beginning, we we don't serve any ads at all. The only thing we have is a reward um, video. And I think that's big because reward video, we have done tests before and it's shown that people who engage in reward video actually have higher retention and uh, higher conversion rate as well. So uh, we focus on that and then going and then as we, you know, the game kind of progress um, with uh, more user coming in and we decided we kind of understand how they behave and how they play the game. Uh, we kind of put in industry show as well with the same thing. Well, you know, they have to be reach a certain level. They haven't spent any money. And then we start kind of show very few, I would say probably like one or two ad per day, um, depending on time he plays. Um, so I think we, that's, you, you gotta think about that. You gotta think about how do you leverage um, the user experience and to make it, the user keep coming back. If the user doesn't come back, you can show them 10 ads per session. And it doesn't mean it's, it's meaningless because they won't come back the next day. So that's, that's my take. Anything to add, guys? He covered it. I was just going <laughs> to say it depends on the genre of the game. Yeah. Obviously, with Solitaire, there's a very natural endpoint to whether you right. won the game or lost. And so we've always been ad-based. Right. Um, but I think as you're deciding the genre, um, if you're going to have an economy and ways for users to earn or, or make purchases versus advertising, I think, um, you know, We'd all like 100% of our users to monetize in our free-to-play games, but uh, we know the numbers aren't there. And so you're honestly looking at over 90% of your users that you won't be able to monetize right. through a pay transaction. So I think it's best to have a strategy going in of how you're going to monetize them with all three avenue sources so that you don't find yourself without any revenue at the end of the day. Yeah. And Michelle, I mean, I think for you guys, it's really interesting. Like you started out as a as a paid game, one title, well, not one title, but one big title, and then you know evolved to you know your most recent release being free to play. You know, lots of big ad initiatives in the company. You know, you're you're entirely focused on it. I mean, how has that evolved over the last few years? And is is there a change of kind of mindset that has to happen in the company? Yeah, absolutely. And and it took some time. I mean, yeah. when I when I first started, I was brought in to build a brand business and to just improve overall ad monetization. And there was really kind of an active dislike mm. from all of the game, our game teams for any sort of advertising because th at, at the time what we had was banner ads and interstitials, things that were interruptive that didn't look that pretty and that users generally didn't like. And so it was definitely a progression and an evolution of working together and the first thing I said to the, to the teams the first week I started was, hey, if we work together, we can do so much better. Right. And so we've evolved the ad formats to, you know, like you say, rewarded videos, much more engaging, fans like them, we get good feedback, it keeps fans in the games longer. Uh, and we have also a very broad audience base uh, for our Angry Birds games in particular, and so it gives also younger users uh, a mm -hmm. chance to, to play the games, not have to spend money, but, you know, we're still monetizing a much larger percentage of our audience. So, but it was certainly an evolution, yeah. both of mindset and product to get to a place where everyone's happy and we feel like we're monetizing well, but we're not turning fans off right. and the products are, are, are much more interesting. Got it, great. So let's talk for a second about ad networks, the source of many of your, your games ads. 
Um, how many ad networks, ne networks do you run within the game? So each one of these is a, you know, an integration, a relationship, a, a legal document. You know, there's a lot involved in each one of these. And here we see a, a pretty big range. Uh, at, at the highest, 16, I think 16 plus was the response, uh, down to like three or four. Um, and I want to also couple this with this kind of thought that there are so many ad networks. I'm one of them, you know, I'm sorry to be one of many, but uh, there, there's lots of different flavors of ad networks and, and everyone has their specialty. Um, and so I asked the, the panel, who are some of your top partners? And this list, in alphabetical order, uh, is, is who they came up with. And so if anyone wants to comment on the panel about, you know, why you work with a certain number of ad networks and not more or less, and if there's any particular ad networks that, that do something really special that you like, or you know anything about kind of working with the ad networks to get to have a great relationship to get what you need out of them you know what comes to mind first okay I'll start sure. so um, we probably work with uh, more on the the higher end of the the chart that you showed before and what's interesting is the mix that we have now of ad networks versus when I started is I'd say 80% different hmm. so the partners that were our biggest partners three years ago some of them aren't even on the list anymore. So it, it's constantly evolving. It's sort of a, a living ecosystem where we're always testing new folks, trying to figure out, especially as we changed our ad product set, you know, who's really good at this particular type right. of ad, whether it's a, a reward video or interstitial, and in which geography, because that can really vary dramatically. And so for us, um, you know, I probably get, like you guys probably do, an email every single day from an ad network somewhere in the world right. that wants to help monetize our traffic. And we have our own SDK, our own platform that we wrap those into. So there's really only so many that, that we can wrap in, otherwise the SDK becomes far too heavy. Yeah. So sometimes it's a, ch it's a question of, well, who do we remove yeah. to try someone new? Um, and uh, you know, it, it really does constantly evolve. And you know, I'll say on the rewarded videos, there's, there's some folks that, that just don't sell that. Um, and there's, there's some people that do a great job at that. And so we're starting to favor those partners just as we move more and more of our ad mix to rewarded videos. Got it. So for us, it's a mix. Um, it has to do with scale and size because um, depending upon the size of your audience base and the number of uniques you have every day, you may need more or less. We're also on the larger side of the networks um, that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and it, it does come down to specialty um, video versus interstitial versus native. So again, it goes back to the integration of how you're going to use ads within your games to make sure that you're delivering the best user experience. Cool. And not everyone has to answer if you don't want to. Um, yeah, we can no move along. Okay. But if you have first, to say. first and foremost, I think um, HyperMX is definitely one of the SDK you have to put in. <laughs> <laughs> your Just money is in an envelope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the reason for that, there's a, there's a good reason for it, um, is because it's different. It's um, when you have, you know, h hundreds, if maybe, maybe, yeah, around 100, I would say, uh, video different network providers, everyone, it's almost like the same. It's cookie cutter, right? And from the UA side kind of things, that when we buy um, video, reward video uh, install, we just don't buy from one network. We buy from all the networks. So what happened is, you know, it's all about the click-through rate, the in install rate. So it, for reward video, you might end up seeing you know, five different Game of War video because if you use a mediation layer, because what happened is they would pump pimp the highest ECPM and then it would just go to the next one, you know, next one, next one. Maybe it just all happened to Game of War from five different networks. So do you need to do that? Is it a good user experience? Probably not. So you gotta get a good mix. And something like HyperMX, we just do brand video right now, um, would would be a good mix because it, it gives the user a little bit interesting um, user experience that they're seeing something different. Oh, it's like, oh, this is interesting. And then, and then it, you know, the payouts is different, right? They don't have to engage. So it's, it's a definitely a good choice. And for us anyway, we have, what we're looking for is diversity, right? What is one provider, what they have is another provider doesn't have. So for example, you know, Keep would be a reward, reward set you know, not many out there. So we, we, we partner with them. Um, we have a mediation layer. Chopper is probably for industry shows. Um, you know, tap is for off the wall. So everything, everyone, every single network is, is a little bit different. And we try to pick that. And for, you know, 
and that's all depends on the size of the game as well. We are struggling a lot right now um, to put a lot of SDK in our game because we try to just squeeze it under the uh, 100 meg limit for, for Apple. And, uh, and it also doesn't help that we, we don't have a dedicated engineer in marketing. So uh, we always have to beg and you know, buy lunches for the engineer to help you know, get them, get the movement going. So yeah, that's, that's also a challenge for it. Yeah, yeah, for us, we're actually, I'd say we're, we're the opposite of Rovio, where you know, we try to uh, work with as few uh, partners as possible. And, and, and really, I think the approach for us is, is looking at a strong partner that can do multiple ad units, whether that's videos, uh, interstitials, um, off walls, whatever it may be, um, and, and really working with the companies that, that will really be willing to optimize for you as well. I mean, optimization on the uh, the ad network sites is is massive, and um, you know, for us, the the opportunity to experiment or, or test out new ad networks is is we're a little bit of conservative, uh, s simply because you, you know, once you have a strong partner that's delivering consistent fill, um, you know, delivering strong eCPMs. The uh, the desire for risk is is uh, you know you, it starts to disappear. So you, you don't want to potentially try a network X and then be down for three, four, or five days or whatever, and then realizing how much revenue uh, you you potentially have lost. Um, and again, I think I think it depends on, on where you're at. Uh, if you're with a strong partner, then you know the, the willingness to, to to go out and test the waters uh, is, is just not there. Got it. So something uh, was just said about not having a dedicated marketing team. Um, is an interesting thing, or a dedicated engineering team for this. So I'm actually gonna skip ahead a few slides to discussion around, uh, here we go. So ad integrations, and, and this picture is just something I like to use in every presentation I have. I, it has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but. Um, <laughs> so two questions. The time it takes to test and integrate a network, how long is that? So we see quite a range here. Someone says one week. Someone said up to eight months, right? And as an ad network, I experience this all the time. We have a, someone will, say, hey, we want to work with you guys, and they're live in two weeks. You know, uh, some other people you know, talk to for a long time, a trip to Helsinki maybe to, to make things happen, and then a year later you, know, you, you might be working with them. Um, that kind of thing. So it, it's all over the place. And then you know, related to that is the question of, do you have a dedicated team for ad integrations? Now, all four of you actually answered yes to this, so maybe one of you didn't mean to, but um, a couple, couple questions on this. So what, you know, what does it take to be efficient in ad network integrations, is it about having a team that does this specifically, or you know, if you do have that team, how do you keep those guys motivated? Maybe this guy joined your company to make games, and now you're turning him into an ad tech engineer. You know, how do you make it kind of part of the culture of your company to actually get this stuff done, get it done quickly because it's important? You know, any any experiences that you can lend here? We've been quite lucky. I've uh, you know I've got a small uh, uh, integrations team and. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's no secret sauce. I mean, it's not like we, you know, throw them Snickers bars and donuts every day to, to keep them motivated. Um, they're they're intensely smart. I've got I've been blessed with with uh, you know three engineers that are just just amazing. They knock out the SDK integrations and uh, in, in very very quick time. So so we're lucky on that on that part, and they they really seem to enjoy what they're doing. So um, the motivation seems almost seamless. Um, our, our I think our biggest uh, bottleneck uh, internally is is always is always QA, I and mean, we're, we're, we're a smaller company, right? And then, you know, we've got our QA is looking at the game side as well as uh, ad integrations, the derivative products, and so forth and so on. So, uh, so for us, it's, it's really, uh, the integra integration seems to usually knock them out fairly fast. It's, it's just uh, getting it checked and, and getting live, really. So, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a whole lot of uh, <laughs> the share on that part. We're, we're lucky. That's, that's a good thing. Any other thoughts? I'll cop to being the eight-month person. <laughs> um, I know. And you I probably know, know this. Yeah. yeah but, well, basically, because we have our own platform. So if we work with a new partner, we will integrate their SDK into ours. And then each one of our game teams then has to take the right. new version of our, our, our latest SDK and integrate it into their game. And they'll do that, you know, at basically whatever their next update cycle is. So depending on, um, you know, where you end up falling, if the whole shebang has just been updated, well, it's going to wait until the next when we won't push out an update generally just because we have, right. you know, a new, uh, new ad partner. Um, so it, it can take some significant time for us. We're not as nimble, maybe. Got it. <laughs> cool. All right. Um, so I'm going to actually skip back to where we were before. Um, okay. So 
a lot of talk about brand ads. You know, Kenneth was talking about it. It's what we specialize in. And people are interested in brand ads because you know, it's a premium experience. They drive high payouts. They're differentiated. Um, question was, do you have a dedicated team for, for selling your ad space? Um, and that could be either for you know, going out and reaching out directly to brands to try to you know, bring those deals in yourself, or even doing you know, cross-promotion deals with other games where you're, you know, you're, you're kind of bypassing the ad network uh, to have you know, uh, that direct relationship. So we, said, we saw one person say yes, and I'm guessing that's Michelle, because that's her job. Um, and one of the things I think is interesting, and, and we, kinda, we, we talk to games every once in a while, who, or companies that say, hey, what does it take to get a direct integration? Can you guys set that up for us? And it's kind of this question like, well, do you guys have enough DAU? Can you commit to a certain level of resources to build something custom? What do you, like, what, what do you see that these brands are looking for when you go out and say, yeah, I want to do something, okay, it's Angry Birds, you've heard of it. What are they looking for in terms of DAU? You know, what's realistic for you know, a company that's kind of coming up and getting some success? Are they going to have a, a chance to work with brands directly? It's challenging. Uh, I think brands are a little bit hesitant a lot of times to invest in, in mobile games. For a lot of them, it's just very new, mm -hmm. and they, don't, um, they maybe don't understand the audience, and they're just, you know, most of their budgets, digital budgets, are taken up by Google and Facebook and right. folks like that, and they have a smaller experimental budget, and unless you have something that has a clear brand name and it's a, it's a launch. Brands often want to be involved in a launch of a big game. So we, for example, just launched Angry Birds 2. So we have a, a pedigree and a proven track record right. and brands new. Well, it's probably going to get a decent amount of downloads. Yeah. I'm, I'm probably safe doing that. But if it's a, you know, if it's a smaller uh, you know, game studio or if it's maybe if even for us, when we launch new IP, it's like, well, mm. maybe we'll wait and see. Right. So it, it, is, it is challenging. I think you really have to bring the brand something that has high visibility. I think the DAU really needs to be at least a million um, for it to make sense. And then, it could again, it depends on which market you're talking mm -hmm. about. But, um, and, and I think it, it really, brands want to give fans something of value in the game, and we think that that's a win-win. So it needs to be something like it's a power-up or something you would normally buy or it's content that's exclusive and the mm -hmm. only way to access it is courtesy of this brand by interacting with this brand. So I think that's important is it needs to be additive. The brand needs to feel like there's going to be a halo effect because right. they've just made someone happy mm -hmm. in the game and it needs to be highly visible. Right, right. Chandra, I know you guys work with a lot of ad Ad, you know, different types of ad units. Do you ever do something like, like skin the table to to have a brand on there for a few weeks or anything like that? No, we, we haven't done that yet. But it's something um, we're definitely exploring in terms of what does it mean to have native in mm -hmm. our solitaire apps. And mm -hmm. so, looking forward to exploring that with folks. I think the challenge there is how do you make it scale? Yeah. So you could make one advertiser very happy, one engineering team very sad, and <laughs> not be able to actually right. uh, replicate that very easily. Right. And so as we look at that, that'll be um, really one of the first questions because um, Michelle and I have actually done this in the past where mm. we would do custom um, executions and they were great, they were splashy and we, we had a lot of fun doing it. Um, but then the advertiser always wants to best what their competitor did, and mm. so we were constantly trying to outdo ourselves. And right. so it's figuring out how to how to make that scale. Uh, it's it. really one of the challenges there. Cool. Yeah, every brand I've advertiser wants something that's never been done right, before. Right, right. And, like, and, and that's not what my engineering <laughs> team wants to hear right now. Yeah, yeah, got it. Okay. Um, so something to talk about for a second is mediation. Uh, so running multiple ad networks in, in one place through one system so that you know, it's kind of managing itself on a day-to-day -day basis. I just wrote here, like, mediation is not one line of code. It's a little bit complex. Um, we see, you know, we have a mediation solution. There's several others on the market. Um, and then several companies will build their own. Uh, but it's kind of a hot topic in the industry right now. And just wanted to, you know, they, I asked the question, are you, uh, running internal or third-party mediation software, and uh, three out of four in this case are running internal, um, which is actually a little bit against the trend right now. We're seeing more and more people kind of go to third parties. Um, quick thoughts on, on you know, for you guys to answer that you're building it yourself. Has that been worth it? Has it um, been challenging? What are some of the benefits of, of your own versus kind of outsourcing that? Sure, I'll start on that. So we built our own uh, internal mediation platform, and... Um, the answer is yes. Um, I'm glad we did it. Um, I'm happy we have the control. Um, it's um, something that we're continually uh, refining, um, but it gives us the, the flexibility to uh, 
to, again, I think control and keeping it in-house is, is probably the best answer I can give you guys. Uh, and, and allows us to be able to, to fine tune things uh, whenever we need to be, you know, some, some weekends we might uh, get a call from, from one of our uh, ad partners and saying, hey, there's, there's a burst campaign going on. Um, can you, you know, give us uh, some more traffic or whatever it may be and we can, we can um, adjust accordingly right on the spot. Um, and the other thing too is I think for, for us is we're, we're constantly looking at how can we bring in everything uh, internally as best as possible, uh, whether that's mediation, whether that's analytics, uh, uh, UA server to server tracking, uh, so forth and so on. So, um, but again, having, having the control I think for us is, is, uh, has been the key component in, in the decision and going internal. Got it. Kenneth, you guys work with a third party. What's that experience been like for you guys? So I think one of the misconceptions um, in terms of mediation is uh, having mediation actually would save you more time in, and do something else. And for myself anyway, it's not true. It's actually you know, double or triple the work that you're doing. Um, the, f the fact of the matter is it mediation, it's, it's, it's only, you can only optimize it if you spend time on it. And it's no different than anything else. So um, because the way that have mediation works is so they you can have all this partner um, within one co well one wrapper of SDK where Brian just brought up that they built themselves um, is that like I mentioned before every single network had probably the same kind of advertisers so how do you kind of make the experience good so you have to kind of do a lot of capping um, how do you maximize your revenues probably have to do a lot of ECPM for uh, basically just talk to your account manager a lot of basically what the, why the performance is doing so badly so sometimes when you deal with like 10 12 different networks and you spending a lot of time each week and just being going over the going over the numbers why the number doesn't make any sense like week to week from each network so I think that's that's one of the challenge um, if I have a choice I would definitely agree that you should build it in-house but it's all come down to resource. Like if you have a dedicated team that, you know, do that, great. You should definitely build it. Uh, it's opportunity cost. For us, we have um, an engineer that mostly focusing on ad tech, but then that's not his sole, you know, responsibility. Those are, that's why, in a way, it, our situation is a little bit different, but we want to try different things. And I think having mediation helps that way kind of, you put in a new network, you don't know how it performs, but the mediation lets you that if it fails, you still have all those stuff that is backing, helping you get the revenue that you need. And so what would you guys say is like the number of engineers you would need to build your own uh, system and, and maintain it? It depends on the engineers. <laughs> <laughs> it always does. But it's not, is so it that's, one, that's one a question. Basically, you just poach uh, Brian's engineer. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Go so find Brian's team and go, three, go right? to LinkedIn and look at who's yeah. doing the, the the work for Big Blue Bubbles. Yeah, no, we, we've got them chained through the desk. So right. There. So about three three people for some amount of time. Gotcha. Any other thoughts from you guys on mediation? I know. Uh, I, I, mean, I would just say for us, you know, we we built our own platform and we've seen tremendous results from that. It absolutely required a lot of resources. We have a pretty sizable cloud services team that mm. that sort of builds all the back-end services for the games and, and the ad platform was, was one of those. Um, but we've seen ECPMs go up, you know, five, six times. Oh, yeah. So having that control has really been, been worth it and paid off for us. Yeah, I think we see the, the trend in the market is that mediation in general is a very good thing. You need to be able to run multiple ad networks to ensure you're getting great fill, global coverage, whatnot. If you've got the team to, to do it your, your own flavor, then that's certainly a route to go. And then there's plenty of options out there if, if you want to, you know, outsource that. So. Uh, it's definitely been a big, big trend in, in the rewarded video space specifically. Uh, okay, so next topic, we just did this, um, segmentation. So I asked everyone, you know, do you segment your users for ads? And all of them said yes. So this is not just toss an ad up to all of your DAU. This is a more thoughtful approach. Um, you know, the obvious thing to do is segment out your non-payers, people who for a certain amount of time of not paid, like, okay, I'll expose them to ads. Have any of you guys done more, anything more kind of sophisticated or interesting or find that, you know, found that like that didn't do the trick for you? You know, what, what have you guys learned along the way for segmentation? So I can actually speak to my MySpace days because mm. we had 25 plus um, attributes for our users and we did our best to pass those along to our networks so that we could um, target ads as best we could. So um, for us, 
age, gender, location are all really popular attributes to have um, available for partners and to create a better user experience, right? So um, the things that I want to see as a female consumer are obviously different than what my male counterparts want to see. And so um, we do our best to create an environment where our network partners can get enough information um, so that they can create the best user experience because that's really what's at the heart of segmentation is making sure that the user sees something relevant. I think when people say, oh, I don't really like ads, and it's not that you don't like the ad, it's that you don't like how mistargeted and mm. how misaligned yeah. it is. Um, and so I think really anything that we can do to better match the advertiser and the consumer is really best for all of us. Gotcha. Anyone else? Yeah, we don't really have uh, that kind of granular uh, style of uh, ad segmentation. Uh, for us, it really is it's just uh, between paying and non-paying users. I think the more you can learn about your users and their behavior, the better. So what we're trying to do, you know, we do the payers and non-payers, but trying to understand you know, at exactly this moment in this, this player's life cycle, what's the best thing to show them? Is it a cross-promotion for another game? Mm -hmm. Are they about to churn out, and so hopefully they churn to another one of right, our own right, games? Right, right, got it. Um, is it someone that has spent before, and we want to offer them a special discount IP bundle, you know, or is it someone? It's is it a, a non-payer, and we should show them an ad. Doesn't mean they'll always be a non-payer. Yeah. So it's it's a little bit of art and science, but right. we're testing, trying to get as granular as possible on that. I'm sure it's different for all genres, but is there kind of like a general guideline, a rule of thumb for how long someone needs to be a non-payer before they're always a non-payer? That's a that's actually a very good question. Um, we surprisingly there are people who play the game for a month before they actually commit. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the power like of the gameplay. And I think, you know, can't say well enough, like reward um, advertising is, 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 I personally see is the thing going forward because essentially it serves as a bridge before it, when someone play your game, they don't want to commit to anything. Why, why would they, right? Uh, unless they're well. Um, and reward advertising allows them to progress in the game and so they don't get stuck but at the same time, you're still getting money from them. And when, once they're committed for that first purchase, then you kind of, like Michelle mentioned, hit them with like remonetization offer. Like if they don't monetize for the next 14 days, send, give them something, randomize it, make sure that you know, they can't, really, don't devalue your economy in a way that, oh, you keep serving up sales, sooner or later they would just wait for the sale to happen, right? So I think you have to you know, be kind of, make it random so they don't really able to track the pattern. But in terms of you know, um, ads, I, I always say that you know, why I'm, I'm just doing what Brian is, uh, is is payer and non-payers. Yeah, got it. Okay, um, along the lines of what kind of ads you're willing to show, do you show directly competitive ads? So if you're a war game, do you let another war game be shown to your users? So uh, we have a range of answers from a straight no to a straight yes and in between. You know, depends on the game, depends on the quality, that kind of thing. Uh, I guess there's a math equation to be had here, which is what is your risk of, of them leaving versus the payout you're getting? Because if someone can advertise their directly competitive game inside of your game, you're going to get a lot of money for that. So any kind of insights there or evolutions of thought on, on that? So for us anyway, um, I, I definitely um, think that quality of your own game how confident are you? Are you confident that you're the best in the genre? If you think that you're the best in the genre, why not show the ad? So if someone even leave and download the other game, most likely we see a lot of time happen is they play the other game and then they come back and they actually spend because we actually able to track that. Um, so someone engaged in that ad and then they will come back before they were a long spender and become spender. Because um, think about, you know, if I only have a $50 Apple gift card, um, so I can only buy $50 worth of stuff, but I like a uh, well-winning game. If I play Casual Client and all of a sudden there's a new game come out, I play a little bit, I was like, oh, just not as good. The first thing you do, go back to Casual Client, is just spend your 50 bucks on Casual Client. <laughs> so um, that's what's gonna happen. So I, I, I think you have to have, you know, understanding your position in the, in the genre is very important for us. It's really interesting. We have a lot of philosophical debates about yeah. this internally. There's definitely people that think we should never show an ad for any, anyone else's game, whether mm. it's directly competitive or not, in our games, because why would you? It's encouraging people to leave. 
our game. Um, the reality of mobile ad monetization right now is if you were to do that, you'd be turning off most of your revenue, certainly from networks. Yeah. And so I think it's, it's a balance. And so we, in some cases, we won't show directly competitive ads ever. In some cases, it, for some sort of launch period, we won't allow anything even remotely competitive. Um, but of course, you know, on the flip side, where you're really going to get uh, game companies spending money with you is if it's directly competitive, yeah. because that's those are the users they want. So it's, yeah. it's it's a balance of you know monetization versus you know not giving your fans too much of an opportunity right. to easily leave. It's network. really interesting. I think it speaks to the fact that we're still in the early days of this whole world, because if you think about you know real world places you go, you walk into a to the MGM Grand in, in Las Vegas, there's no ad for Caesar's Palace, right? You're not gonna go down and, and see those kind of competitive ads. Or you go to one movie theater, they're not advertising the next. Um, so I think over time, we'll see it go away as more options become available for you guys, as all the brands like really start to park more of their money into mobile, then you know, we'll have to do this less and less often. But I think for, for the time being, it's certainly gonna be a thing for, for you know, the foreseeable future. Um, cool, uh, let's see. So. Last topic is, okay, not all types, not all ad types and platforms are created equal. So we see a lot of different ranges of payouts for different types of ads. So uh, focused on two for this, but we can talk about more if you'd like. Um, I asked them, what are the average uh, eCPMs, so you know, uh, revenue per thousand views on iOS in the US? So it's kind of like the standard for what people talk about in terms of average payouts. Um, for a static interstitial, so a, you know, a, a full page ad, non-video, we see anything from $1 to $7. For a rewarded video, which we've talked about a lot today, where a user is engaging in order to get a, a reward, um, we see anything from $8 to $25. Um, I think these are pretty standard answers, actually, for what I'd see I around the industry. Um, if anyone wants to have any comments about the ranges they're seeing or, or kind of like what they see is their kind of the cycles like up and down, that might be interesting. And then also, um, kind of from a geographic standpoint, you know what do you expect to see in, say, Europe versus the US? And then if you want to also, Android versus iOS. So these are kind of the different axes you can think about. What's the drop off for Android these days versus iOS? So you know, whatever you guys have had some interesting experiences, please comment. I think the first thing I'd say is that your range depends on the quality of your user. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important if you're talking to a network to not be sold on, I can double your revenue, I can deliver $15 CPMs, because most of the buyers are performance-based and they're backing into a number that works for them. Right. And so it really depends on the quality of the user and how you've matched that user with the ad. And so I think that's part of the reason you see the range, right? So I think that's one of the more important things to keep in mind is that the quality that you can deliver for your partner will directly tie back to your, your ultimate eCPM. Right, makes sense. And one thing I think you should definitely uh, keep in mind too is fill rate. I mean, any ad network could be like, yeah, I'll give you a hundred dollars CPM and deliver you one <laughs> ad in the day, right? I mean, it's and that's that's ridiculous. So I mean, it, that's something to consider as well. Um, and it definitely, I agree with that as far as the the, the quality of, of yeah. your own users will kind of dictate how much uh, the ad network works will be wor uh, willing to work with you on on, on some some very lucrative uh, ECPMs. Yeah. So you know, in, in your games, definitely, you know, that th the the one question we ask is ECPM sounds great, let's run, but what's your fill rate? What's your worldwide, you know, fill rate? Yeah. What's the U.S.? What's the, um, you know, give me the average ECPM for in the entire world, U.S. only, or whatever your target may be. Um, but you know, fill rate without uh, ECPM means nothing without fill, and and uh, and fill without ECPM is kind of pointless as well. So they kind of really uh, tie hand in hand, um, and you know, based on the the ad unit itself, you can you know banners all the way through um, uh, rewarded video, forced video. Um, and even uh, offer walls, are, you know, I know that's not uh, a whole lot of popular things, but you know, they they are they can be very lucrative as well. Yeah, I think you're asking the right questions. When I when I talk to someone about our ad network, you know, at a game, and they ask me about our ECPMs, which is, you know, a great selling point for us because we work on brands. If they don't ask me about fill and countries and stuff, I'm like, come on, this is you're you're being too light on me here. This is not easy. You know, this is not difficult because uh, every every country is different. You know, brands are interesting because you have to have a sales team in every country to get brand campaigns for that country because you know the Germany Coca-Cola team has different creative, different budget than the US one. Whereas if you go to Germany and talk to Wuga and get their advertising dollars, that's a global spend, right? So, and some ad networks just really, do, you know, are very European focused or Asian focused, you know? So like, you have to, you have to ask these, these kind of questions when you're, when you're looking at this stuff. 
Um, any thoughts on Android versus iOS and expectations there? So based on the sorry, based on the number that we we seen that um, definitely um, iOS users more engaged um, mm. with with reward videos anyway. On average, on for for us anyway, they watch uh, roughly iOS watches thirty percent more video. And in terms of uh, eCPM, I would say that it's getting closer. Um, definitely, a lot of network is having. You know, a much doing a much better job in terms of selling Android ads. Um, it used to be around, I would say, the difference would be around 50 percent. Now I would say that it's closer within, you know, 25 to 30 percent better for for iOS. Got it. Cool. Um, all right, so we've got a few minutes left. I wanted to open it up to any questions that you guys have for the panelists. Um, I guess we'll we'll steal Brian's microphone, I think, and run that around. Um, Anything? Yes, sir. We'll go here first. Or actually, wait for the microphone. It's for. It's actually for the video. That's fine. So the rewarded video seems to be a big thing. Like, do you see that to be a trend across all tiers, or like there are tier three, tier four, where the data access plans are limited? You see users not interacting with rewarded video as much, and those eCPMs, I'm guessing, are significantly lower. Yeah, I think I think for us it's um, you're, you're you're dead on. Um, it's I think it's not so much more to do um, uh, a data issue. It's it's really uh, what the the um, the ad networks are, are providing. Right, where are they filling? Um, we're seeing more like tier three countries. I think it's it's really it's still very much uh, more more interstitials, uh, more you know static images, so forth, so on over video. Um, whether that's the advertisers for those territories not engaging in video, I'm not too sure. Or if it, like as you said, if it's a if it's a data issue and people don't want to be wasting their burning their data on, on videos, that could be the issue as well, or it could be a combination of both. Um, but yeah, I think I think uh, yeah, yeah, you, you're, you're pretty dead on that. We had a question over here. Hi. Um, I was just wondering what your opinion was on how ad networks are going to adapt to smaller screens, like uh, wearable devices, and whether that's on their radar um, at all, and whether that's relevant at this time being. I, I could speak to that a little bit. Um, <laughs> it's something that I'm sure we're all looking at. You know, we've, we've looked at, um, right now, Apple's not really allowing ad networks to really play on the watch. Um, and there's not really video playback functionality, so video, you know, it'll be a long time before that comes. But it's a new, it's a new platform, and it's going to evolve. And I think eventually there will be plenty of opportunities there. So there'll be new formats. There's people already are building new formats for it that they can't yet apply. But um, uh, certainly there'll, there'll be something there. But it's going to be a little bit, I think. And you'll you'll see some eventually some very interesting native kind of placements within uh, experiences. And um, with with you know, at some point there's going to be this like amazing hit Apple Watch kind of game slash social experience. And then we'll be able to see if, if people can work native ads into that, I think will be the, the interesting thing. So it's a little TBD at this point. Hi, a uh, quick question about um, portfolio level analysis. So you, got, you all work at companies that have multiple games. I'm curious, both from the, from the perspective of advertising as well as mo larger monetization, do you, um, do you consider your players from the perspective of the whole portfolio or individual games? For us, it's uh, definitely individual games because the game experience is different. So we focus on sports and first person shooting. Um, sports, first person, uh, first person shooting is hard to sell it to brands uh, in terms of having a custom one-off sponsorship um, because you know. Because there's heads exploding in the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a lot of blood. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> there is a lot of blood. Um, but for sports, it's actually easier. So we we done you know uh, our, a weekend of sponsorship where Pepsi comes in and just take over our tournament and basically we just plaster Pepsi all over the place. Um, so I think it's uh, it's definitely the gameplay, the genre. It has to be different, and you can't cookie cutter one way of doing things for all your games. Unless you keep producing the same games. <laughs> oh. 
I, I would say that we, we definitely, it's individual game teams because they own their own P&Ls, they own their own business. That said, we often do campaigns that go across our, you know, multiple Angry Birds titles, for example, so within the franchise. So certainly we'd rather um, keep as much uh, ad revenue within Rovio proper a, as possible. Um, but yeah, I, I think you're right. I think it's, it's really all about individual teams maximizing their yeah. specific. I've certainly yeah, seen uh, seen companies that have a pretty good network of games and they feel like they're pretty good at moving the users between those. So when they're thinking about like user acquisition, they'll build in a little bit more buffer. Like maybe they would have only spent two dollars to get a user if they could only play the one game, but they know they're confident that you know X percent of the users are going to go play another game. So they may be will willing to pay two dollars and twenty five cents because of that difference for the the network LTV instead of just a game LTV. But I think you have to be a company that has that kind of in their DNA where you're kind of really all about cross promotion. Is there another question over here? Nate? <laughs> this better be a softball question. Uh, I just wanted to ask you guys, like, how much are your games team involved in designing the ads into the game? Um, I think, you know, back in the day, it was a lot of <clears throat> throw a rewarded video button up in the store, earn 50 coins, but we're seeing more and more ad integrations that features of the game. So um, I know you guys are the monetization managers of your various companies, but how much is the pop, the producers and the, the owners of the product involved in building this stuff into the game? And are you seeing that? I'm seeing it more and more, so just curious what your perspective is from each, I mean, a couple of you at least. While you're doing that. So at Rovio, I would say they're heavily involved. So we start really early out meeting with the executive producer and some of the key folks on the team. And they fill us in, our, our ad sales marketing folks and uh, myself or someone else on my team to figure out what are the best touch points in the game that either they could put a rewarded video ad or where could a potential brand integration make sense. So we start really early and it's kind of an iterative process, but they're very heavily involved because they know their games better than, than we do. Hmm. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, that's the um, same here. Um, the other thing we do too uh, from time to time is we'll actually ask the ad networks, where do you think um, a great placement is be? And, and maybe we'll get some, some tips and some ideas that we hadn't thought of before. But as far as your, going back to your question, the team's very involved. Uh, so we make sure that we, we have uh, the key placements. Yeah. And it really makes a difference when uh, you know, I've had a, a chance to look at a lot of different games and their implementations and, and see metrics on them. And the games where you know, the designers are, are thoughtful about where they place opportunities to watch video, you'll see engagement rates that are 2, 3, 4x. Uh, with video than, than you would have if you just say put a, a button in the store that says watch videos because you know a lot of people who don't ever pay they never go to the store so they never see that button so it's kind of a mismatched placement even though it's very common if you surface it at the right times you're going to get people viewing you know on average maybe one to two videos per day as opposed to you know a, a lazy implementation might be only uh, you know one in four uh, DAU will see a, a video per day so it makes a big difference we got time for one more question anyone anyone Going once, going twice. Cool. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you, big thank you to the panelists. Thank you guys for your time.